I could have. I could have. Okay. Okay. I'd like to introduce our readers. We have Anne Mabor, who's a visual artist and writer. Her installation, I and My White Ancestors, will be at Clackamas Community College in October, and handouts are available down here. She'll be joined by her husband, Dennis, as a support reader because she stutters. Leah Mueller is from Tacoma, Washington, and is the author of a chapbook and two books, and was, featured, was a featured poet at the 2015 New York Poetry Festival. Patrick McDade is the founder and program director for People, Places, Things, Intercultural Communication Services, and he is committed to using his privilege to redistribute social equity. Carol Wellicke grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and has lived in Oregon for over 30 years. She writes poetry and short fiction and currently loves auditing PCC classes. Teresa Tepharova Batman was born in the Czech Republic and is a public school teacher in Portland. Her writing has appeared on several blogs. This is her first print publication. Please welcome her. This is an American story. Past the apple pie, yet I am not American. Past the strudel. This is your story and my story intertwined. For most of my life, I didn't even know I was white. What did I know about myself? I knew I was born in Sacramento, California to an Air Force dad and a mom who was a waitress. We were in Tucson because there was an Air Force base there. But by the time I was four, my mom and dad were divorced. <coughs> and my mom remarried soon after, a carpenter. We were all white, and none of us knew it. Why didn't they tell us? My mother, sister, and I came to this country in the late 1980s from Czechoslovakia, escaping totalitarianism. I was a teenager, thrown for a loop. Everything about this culture confused me. Most of all, life felt lonely here. Initially, what I could not understand were the invisible lines which seems to divide people. We were, we were all white, and, and none, none of us knew it. it. Why, Why didn't they, they tell us? us? Summer in New Orleans lasts a very long time, especially when you're 19 and far from home. I lived alone in a sparsely furnished apartment that was located in the Posh Garden District. The view from my bay window was breathtaking. I could see banana trees through the grate while I lay on my $19 foam rubber mattress in front of the window and listen to music on my rented stereo. In 1978, the population of New Orleans was 75% African American, which, for the first time in my life, transformed me into a minority. Among the photos in my hallway, are matching oval portraits 
of my great-great-grandmother, Eugenia Mary Felder Buchanan, and her husband, John, I decided to begin with Eugenia for my first self-portrait. She was pretty and elegant with lace at her throat and wrists. John was black-haired with fierce eyes. The story passed down was that they were Confederate spies. That turned out not to be exactly true, but John did have to escape to Mexico with a price on his head during General Sherman's march at the end of the Civil War. As I sat sewing Eugenia's enormous skirt and reading her letters, I was hit with a new understanding about my family legacy. The characteristics before me were all so familiar. Obedience, separation, ignorance, and quiet endurance. One evening after work, I stretched out in my bed with a new copy of Figaro and opened the pages eagerly. Its current cover featured a color photograph of David Duke, who had been recently appointed Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Duke was a classic Aryan man with pale skin, piercing blue eyes, and expertly feathered blonde hair. His face wore a deceptively ingenuous expression, as if he had no idea why so many people considered him to be loathsome. The writer on the cover article was puzzled by Duke. He was the poster boy for racism, yet he held an advanced degree, and his IQ was rumored to be off the charts. It was convenient for liberals to believe that all racists were mouth breathers, but David did not adhere to the stereotype. The writer described the bookstore that Duke ran in nearby Metairie, a dark, cavernous establishment known only to insiders. Amongst other accoutrements, it contained an enormous cross that was bedecked with electric lights. Apparently, the cross was breathtaking in its immensity, especially when illuminated in an otherwise darkened room. I was both repulsed and intrigued. Perhaps if I spoke to him, he would say something that would resolve my own conundrum. I knew I was Polish. I knew that because it was weird. My mom told me my family had a lot of Polish, and I told someone else, and pretty soon that's what I was. I was a weird Polak who hung around with girls and used big words. And Hans <coughs> called me Little Sabra growing up because of my darker skin and curly black hair. It would be an absurd presumption, a kind of oppression chic, to not call myself white. And yet, just beneath my white skin, so much troubled history, fear. Thirty years ago, back in Brooklyn, Mama warned me not to cross the Hudson. There be dragons, she just as well have said, and they are anti-Semites. I hopped a bus and traveled as far as I could, away from Jewish, from grind crime, and cramped living. I wasn't oblivious. In Jewish summer camp upstate, local kids threw stones and slurs at us at the county fair. I learned that kike meant me. After six months of full-time research, I ended up with a combination of likely ancestors covering 2,000 years of European-American history from 1870 back to 300 BCE. In America, the list includes two slaveholders from South Carolina and a pilgrim from Plymouth Colony who gained land and resources from the Wampanoag. Traveling back in time to Britain, I chose a Scottish farmer who was a juror on a witch trial, an English mercenary soldier, and social climber who fought to colonize Ireland, and an English noblewoman caught in the middle of the bloody War of the Roses. In the medieval era, there was a basil cheesemaker who supported the execution of Jews during the Black Death. King Edward I of England, who conquered Wales, invaded Scotland and expelled the Jews from England. And a Frankish countess who became a nun and benefited from the colonization of Jerusalem during the Crusades. 
Lastly, I found a Norman knight who helped Duke William conquer England. A female Viking who invaded Orkney. And a gold metal worker from the Celtic Iron Age who supported the warrior elite. I am not, am not exceptional. Similar ancestor stories are replicated throughout history. My particular family came to America from England, Scotland, and Switzerland during the early development of the country with all the benefits contained therein, land, slave and indentured labor, and natural resources. There is no question that I have profited from being a European American from the day I was born. Could I use my history to model what taking responsibility might look like? I flipped over the phone book. If there was another man in the New Orleans metro area who bore the unfortunate name of David Duke, I could simply apologize to him and terminate the call. I reached over to my phone and lifted the receiver. May I please speak to David Duke? I'd like to talk to David about the clan. I have some questions about it. I'm curious about your bookstore, and I would like to see it. The process of discovering my whiteness and how deep it goes and how unconscious it is has been long and meandering. It's about the assumption that white is normal. It's about the deck being stacked. Something I've learned about my whiteness, it's slippery. Reading about the sociology of class and white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wasp culture provided me with a key to unlock some of the mysteries that have colored my experience in this society, but which I couldn't understand because my family comes from a Slavic stock shaped by a mix of Jewish and Catholic influences. Gradually, I came to find that I could credit much of my reality in this society to white supremacist culture. It was 1980, and I landed in Oregon. In random conversations with bus drivers, store owners, in a book group, at a party, someone would pull out the phrase, you New York types, or ask with disarming smile, what's your ethnicity? You could hear the question coming long before it was spoken, a chess move you knew in your bones. The eager wish to catalog, to know, ah, a Jew, thought so. I was no longer with my people, and I felt it. The ideology of whiteness as status utterly develop, envelops us, Europeans, in its poisonous embrace. We cannot escape its cocoon. Rather, we carry whiteness with us like a charm that protects us from harm, shields us from impact as we dive from the known to the unknown, parachute from one spot on the globe to another as immigrants, tourists, or do-gooders abroad. The poison of white supremacy we ingest with our mother's milk lingers. The bus ride was hot and interminable. As my stop neared, I grew anxious. I pulled the cord and disembarked from the bus. I stood for a moment on the sidewalk in front of David Duke's bookstore, blinking like a mole in the harsh mid-afternoon light. Feeling slightly ill, I rang the doorbell and then stood on the threshold, fidgeting nervously. Welcome to my store, he said expansively. Are you thirsty? I can offer you a Pepsi. He fixed me with a beatific grin and watched approvingly as I took an appreciative gulp from the bottle. Oppressive beliefs and behaviors like racism, colonization, and genocide have their source in Europe. We must have learned them somewhere or at least become vulnerable to, to accepting them as truth. Patterns like greed, arrogance, superiority, and believing that conquering other people and their land and resources is the right thing to do in the name of honor, religion, family, and country. I was not proven wrong. All those things are illustrated in European history over and over. I, I came, came from, from these specific, specific people. My, my body is connected to them. The color of my skin, the shape of my nose and eyes, 
texture of my hair, my height, my hands, all of it. I put on types of clothes they might have worn and imagine my hands fingering a sword, wielding an axe, carrying a bowl of soup, skinning a rabbit, sewing a dress, preparing for the next battle, believing that I am right. All of the walls were lined with pamphlets that bore such ominous titles as the Negro Problem and Taking Back Our Heritage. A glass shelf stood beside the cash register filled to overflowing with souvenir coffee cups and glow-in-the-dark Klansman figurines. What do you think of our inventory? Duke asked. Pretty impressive, huh? Well, there certainly is a lot of it, I said politely. But really, what is the point of this bookstore? What are you trying to do here exactly? I started this bookstore with a mission, he explained. I don't hate black people. They have their own heritage, and I respect that. You and I are white, however. We have a different heritage. I'm proud of our heritage, and I want to preserve it. He stared into my eyes like a trained hypnotist, while his long hands gestured in front of my face. I returned his gaze, nodded slowly, and found myself sinking into a kind of spell. Then I shook my head, as if I had returned to land after spending some time underwater. And I opened my mouth to speak. I'm not interested in joining the plan, I said. I was just curious to find out how you operate over here. People get confused about racism. How could racism possibly have created such rifts between people? Try calling white people white. One of the things that will happen is that a lot of white people will call you racist. What's really going on is they want you to protect them from never having to think about race. That's protecting their privilege. The privilege to walk through life whistling and not having to think about it. <coughs> the Brooklyn neighborhood my sister and I grew up in was largely black and Jewish. The first boy I kissed was black, as was the girl who taught me to peck out a boogie woogie on the black keys of her family piano. I felt comfortable in that mixed world, the world I'd known up until then. I have a white friend who said to me one time, how often do you think about your race? I told her maybe three, four times a week. I thought I was being honest with myself, admitting that I sometimes think about race. Then she said, see that black guy over there? How often do you think he thinks about race? As the neighborhood became more black, whites who could afford it moved to the suburbs, a familiar pattern. In memory, it was the end of, if not color blindness, then a kind of color and self-consciousness. We moved to a whiter neighborhood of Italians, Irish, Greeks, Jews, people like ourselves. And, and then, then it happened. happened. I, I turned white. white. Duke's enormous cross hung majestically on one wall and looked down upon folding chairs and cardboard boxes of clan literature. Its bulbs gleamed ominously in the semi-darkness. He reached inside one of the boxes and removed a handful of slightly yellowed newspapers. Please take these and read them if you get the chance. As I had been trained to be polite, I allowed Duke to place the newspapers into my left hand. My fingers reflexively clutched the pages before I could stop them or think of an excuse. I don't want to put my ex on white because I feel somewhat alienated from the party, unsure exactly who is friend or foe. Jews are well accepted in America and I don't want to overstate the case. My whiteness protects me and privileges me and hides me as well. I, I truly am my white ancestors. ancestors. 
My life is filled with decisions I make to maintain a privileged life based on the oppressions of others, past and present. I keep silent when I hear comments among my white friends that are subtly racist. I live off money I inherited from my grandparents and parents. I don't have many friends who are not white. I let fear stop me from reaching out to people of color. I buy clothes made by people who are paid poorly and work in unsafe conditions. I live in a nice apartment and eat healthy food and look away from people who are homeless or poor. Mostly these are ways I stay passive and unconscious because to feel the full truth about racism and the harmful effects of capitalism would be unbearable. I want to be white for its ease in the world. It is a passport whose benefits I enjoy. It gives access. But I was born with dual citizenship and that dualism shapes. Just beneath white, I want to write Jew because to assert Jew is to raise a defiant middle finger to history. The history of my dear people's destruction and permanent unease within the dark side of European Christianity. The progenitors of who we talk about when we talk about white in America. At first glance, whiteness establishes all benefits, advantages, and shiny packages, of sparkly goodies. But the truth is that white people don't make it through unscathed. Clearly, maintaining this hegemonic system comes at a cost to us whites. Recent studies show that white middle-aged men, unlike other groups, have a mortality rate that is rising at a rapid pace. They are dying from stress-related causes. White Americans are also the biggest terror threat. We have been led to feel disconnected from the humanity of others as well as from our own. We fear being cast out from the only club to which we tentatively belong. This, this is the, the deadly, deadly setup we are up against. against. And it is high time for us to attempt to break free from these narratives and redefine our place as white people in the society and the world. I scurried away from Duke's bookstore. Finally, I boarded the bus. As I fumbled in my purse for change, I accidentally dropped the clump of newspapers. An updraft caught one of the papers, and the pages tumbled through the aisle like autumn leaves. I stumbled down the center of the bus and hastily gathered the pages while the passengers stared straight ahead, indifferent to my plight. One of the pages came to rest beside a middle-aged African-American woman's foot. She lifted the paper from the floor and handed it to me. Finally, she redirected her gaze through the dirt crust of the bus window and stared outside with an impassive expression on her face. Thanks, I said, as I slid into the space beside her. I want to believe that given a chance, human connection always wins out. Most white people are no longer white supremacists, but still believe they are superior. In order to not be white superior, you have to recognize that there's an assumption that whiteness is normal, and you have to commit to ending it, not just pretend it isn't there. Every week, if not day, come new stories of police violence against black men and women, unarmed, armed, guilty, innocent. The crisis of black demolition remains a constant. It's a crisis of forest, not just trees. I am obligated to witness this. I am scared that the violence lurking beneath the mask of white supremacy will bubble out, targeting me as a woman, as someone with Jewish heritage, someone with a black partner and mixed race kids. This fear is real and visceral, but I organized despite it. Two years ago, with several others, I helped to form a group to educate, educate organize, and, and mobilize white people to work for racial, racial justice. justice as part of a multiracial majority for justice. We raise funds for grassroots organizations led by people of color. We volunteer our time and skills. We bring food. We show up and plan, uh, to show up to and plan rallies. We phone bank and door knock to discuss issues pertinent to our community and to the Black Lives Matter movement. We educate ourselves as well as other white people in our circles. We practice interrupting racism. 
This is hard work for me. This, this is, is my antidote to violence, apathy, and despair. Embracing white identity and heritage as a step towards ending racism might seem counterintuitive, but this history is living in all white people in varied ways, and the more we deny it, the bigger it looms. For me, this process has been a way to understand and feel a part of my historical family, while at the same time taking responsibility for their actions and the privileges I inherited. I try to embody what I long for other white people to do, which is to answer the call to acknowledge and renounce whiteness for its historical and current inseparability from racial violence and oppression. I want white people to organize en masse, divest ourselves from the narrow definition of success in the capitalistic society that forces us to subscribe to the deadly values of white supremacy. What is asked of us is nothing short of building a new world rooted in collective action, shaped by a narrative that strives to re-envision, co-create, collaborate, liberate across ingrained divisions of race, class, gender, and all the rest. This, this is your story and my story intertwined. Pass the trowel, take the hoe, and let's keep working together.